Educators are the servants of the humanities. It is our job to transfer the accumulated values, lessons, skills, and knowledge of our ancestors to the next generation. But more importantly, we're also the servants of humanity. And in many cases, we're the last line of defense for some of humanity's most valuable natural resources. Play, imagination, creativity, hope. So today, I want to challenge all of you, but especially the educators among us, to be a protector of those natural resources of humanity. Be a protector of the dreamer. But what is the dreamer? Well, I started thinking about the concept of the dreamer a few years ago when I was asked to talk about creativity and explain what is creativity. And I got into a whole line of thinking about the right side of the brain and a lot of different aspects of our intelligence that exists in a different realm than our thinking mind. I found that one of the most helpful ways for me and for others to engage with this topic was by looking at a list of contrasts, a list of opposites. I developed names for these identities, uh, the thinker, kind of the left side, logical side, and the dreamer. So now to, to introduce the dreamer, we're going to look at some opposites of the thinker and the dreamer. If the thinker were reason, the dreamer would be creativity. If the thinker were conscious, the dreamer exists in the unconscious state. The thinker is the brain, the dreamer is the body. The thinker is the head, the dreamer, the heart. The thinker is synthetic, it's made by man, it's created by us. Whereas the dreamer is organic, it exists naturally, outside of us and not something that we can even uh, have an impact on. The thinker is efficient, the dreamer, by definition, is inefficient. The thinker is predictable, follows a schedule, understands time, whereas the dreamer is chaotic. The thinker is planned, the dreamer is spontaneous. The thinker is work, and the dreamer is play. There are a few others. The thinker likes to research and seek the idea, whereas for the dreamer, it's all about intuition, and the idea just comes to you. The thinker will revise a concept. The dreamer will invent a new one. The thinker will memorize. The dreamer will inquire. The thinker is controlled. The dreamer is free. The thinker will decide. The dreamer will explore. The thinker realizes, comes to a realization, while the dreamer imagines. The thinker concentrates, while the dreamer daydreams. The realm of the dreamer is like an open, unlimited field of fertile soil where any idea can grow, where there is an abundance of imagination and creative energy, and all we have to do is tap into it. The thing is, the realm of the dreamer well, it is outside of our conscious mind, and it cannot coexist with the thinker. The dreamer is rooted in joy and passion and freedom. So what it needs, if we use our analogy of a big field, is good soil. What is good soil for the dreamer? It's a safe space. It's a space where I can be me. I can try something that I don't know whether it'll work or not, and I can trust that I'm going to be able to do that and be supported as me. The water in this field that nurtures the plants, that's just acceptance. When I share an idea, a thought, an expression, I feel like in this space I'm going to be accepted, and that's going to be accepted. I also know I'm going to receive encouragement, and that's the sunshine that makes the plants flourish. And finally, the fertilizer on the field, that's movement and momentum. Many times in our creative state, we move our body to get an idea going. I love to get my students out of their mind and into their body because once we move, the creative ideas really start to flow. But the dreamer, as joyous and abundant as it is in its unconscious world, cannot exist around fear, self-consciousness, and negative energy. 
And there are several things, I'm going to highlight four, that are very common parts of our society and our educational system that kill the dreamer, that absolutely make it so the dreamer cannot exist. One is hierarchy. Hierarchy means the best idea comes from the top. The person at the top has the biggest degree or is the most qualified for some reason. They're the ones who ideas matter, and you're supposed to listen and take notes. Creativity doesn't work that way. The best idea can come from a two-year-old. Hierarchy limits the size of the garden. Competition and pressure, that's like drought. That's like taking the water away from the plant. If you have competition to reach some goal or pressure to achieve on some test, there is no way that you can feel free to be creative. Criticism, making fun, ridicule, that is like disease to the dreamer. Nothing kills the dreamer faster than being made fun of, being ridiculed, not being accepted. And finally, and this one took me a while to come to terms with, thinking. Just the act of thinking, testing, measuring, examining, just those simple things destroy the dreamer. It cannot coexist with those things. It's like you've taken the plants up, from out of the ground so you can examine the root structures, the plants will die. So the dreamer can't exist with that. And that is exactly why it needs to be protected. But, but what does it mean to be a protector of the dreamer? Well, I hope to illustrate this concept through some experiences I had growing up, up to this point, of people who were the protector of the dreamer for me. The first, the protector of play and the players. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Thus says William Shakespeare in his play, As You Like It. And when I was a kid, well, I thought that that could have been the truth. You see, my mom was a drama teacher. And so as early as I can remember, I was on and around the stage. There was always talk of that latest musical theater number, some new play that's out on Broadway, or the show that my mom was working on. This is my mom in her office. Um, you can see a Les Mes musical theater poster behind her. And, and just on the other side there, you can see a poster from the variety show she started in our community back in 1978, a show that she's directed in our community every, every year since, up until this past year. This is me as a young guy at the variety show, very much at home with the actors, with the performances, playing, but also just getting to know the world of the stage and the world of drama. This is me a few years later. Now, I was playing uh, a pie salesman that was selling fake pies, and this policeman kept coming by to check, and I would keep coming through different times during the show just to prove that I was selling pies for real. Eventually, he would chase me off the stage every time. I had the best time of my life. So from a very early age, I was on the stage, and I thank my mother for introducing me, my brother and sister and I, to the world of drama, the world of the players. But that wasn't the greatest gift that she gave us. The greatest gift that she gave us was protecting our play. She gave us permission, and she protected our schedules. I look at some of the young people out there these days. They don't have a free minute to themselves. It's as if their parents believe if they were given one hour of free time in a week, they would waste that time for sure, or at least not use it in a productive way, and thereby be passed by some other person competing for that one slot to the great university or the great job or whatever the perceived future success is. Well, my mom didn't have that kind of agenda for us. She gave us long, unbroken, idle periods of time where our minds could wander and we could just enjoy playing and being kids. She didn't have to teach us how to imagine or invent or make believe. That was something that came as naturally to us as walking and talking. The only thing she had to do was protect the time and give us permission. We need more protectors of play. So I went off to school, and, and as the dreamer gets to school, they move from this time of, for me, this wonderful time of play into a time where play is not so accepted. And if you think about it, if we look at some of the traits of the dreamer, we can think about how these traits don't always exactly fit in a school setting. Traits like being inefficient or spontaneous free and chaotic, play even, is relegated to recess and then cut out of the curriculum completely by the time you get to middle school. Exploring, wandering, 
daydreaming? These were certainly not the, the kinds of students that made my classroom easy. The dreamer has a tough time at school, which is why the dreamer needs to be protected at school. Or else you get doodles like this. You know, doodles are just the daydreamer crying out for help. That's what a doodle is, for those of you who aren't aware. I was lucky enough throughout my schooling to have several protectors of creativity who gave us a choice and a chance to be creative at key times, and that gave me a lifeline to my imagination throughout the schooling process. One of those was my second grade teacher, Miss Whitaker. Uh, we ran into Miss Whitaker about a year ago at a summer barbecue. She was 82 years old, but the look on her face, the smile, her, her laugh, the gentle gaze in her eyes, none of that had changed. Time had affected her, of course, but it felt like it had been very gentle with her, and it reminded me of how she was in our class. I used to love her book reports. Does anybody remember book reports? Uh, book reports are where you, you read a book, then you memorize the key parts, the author, the plot, you know, the setting, and then you stand in front and you recite that in front of the class. Well, Miss Whitaker encouraged me to do creative book reports. Oh, I would memorize my entire book report. I would get some props from my mom's prop closet, and I would dress up like a character from the book and deliver the book report in character as a character from the story. That's me right there, uh, wearing the, the homemade wig and the funny-looking little white shirt. Lifeline to my creativity. A little bit later, 11th grade history teacher, Mr. Boyle, he was the most demanding teacher in the school. He was a very, very rigorous grader, and he expected a lot of his students, but he also gave us a creative option. And so for our study of the 1960s decade in America, he let us do a creative presentation as our final, as our final uh, for our final grade. And for me, oh, what a wonder. We did a 20-minute multimedia stage performance that included hippie anti-war rallies, the Martin Luther King, I, I Have a Dream speech, and the assassinations of Robert and John Kennedy. I mean, I can remember that from so many years ago. I remember that like it was last week. I remember it because it mattered to me because I could do it my way, because it does matter. It does matter to give kids a chance and a choice to be creative. We need protectors of creativity. Then off to college. And I have to say, my college years were some of the most fruitful for my dreamer. Short hours of class, long hours of time to explore. I was involved in every after-school club you could imagine. But by the time of my fourth year, when graduation was right around the corner, I kept hearing about the real world. It's time to realize, come to the realization that you're going to be out in the hard, cold world and you're going to have to figure out what to do. And I was scared. According to Gallup research, the most important thing that has the biggest impact on the future success and happiness of a student is a professor who cares about them as a person, gets them excited about learning, and encourages them to pursue their dreams. For me, this was a protector of imagination who I met in college. Mr. Mead, Ernest Mead, affectionately known as Boots. I met him just a few days before the start of this very stressful fourth year, and I can still remember talking to him. The way he would listen, the way he was genuinely interested in what I had to say, my interests and my pursuits, I was fortunate enough to be part of a small group that got to join the Mr. Mead seminar. Mr. Mead had retired many years earlier, and yet he still came back to teach one class every year. It was just called the music seminar, but what it really was was an opportunity for a small group of students to get together with Mr. Mead as a facilitator with no quizzes, no tests, no set curriculum. In fact, all of the content was generated by the students ourselves. We were encouraged to explore any of those concepts, ideas, or subjects that we hadn't had a chance to study in the normal curriculum. But even more than that, Mr. Mead encouraged us to imagine. Know what lights you up, he used to say. If you know what lights you up, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to focus on. In that time of pressure, when everybody was scrambling to find a safe job, to find somewhere safe to land after graduation, Mr. Mead encouraged us to imagine. Imagine the kind of future you want, 
not the kind that's the realistic one that you think you can get. Imagine the kind of future that you think you can bring into this world. Here we are with my small study group, and that's me sitting with Mr. Mead. So when I was presented at the end of my, of my college time with two very different opportunities of what to do next when, when I was getting ready to graduate, the first consulting job, Washington, D.C., stable salary, my parents would have been thrilled, I would have been an hour away from home, or travel halfway across the world to Warsaw, Poland, to work at something called an international school teaching drama. After working with Mr. Mead, the decision for me was easy. And it wasn't that hard for me to convince my parents either, because I knew that even though the first path was definitely the ones to a stable career, a stable income, a stable life, the second path lit up my imagination. And so that's what I did. I went to the international school, the American School of Warsaw, Poland, to be exact, and I started my journey in international education. And what I found there, oh, it was school as school was meant to be. It was a place where teachers were artists, musicians, adventurers, poets, scholars, trusted and respected professionals who were given the, the space, the freedom, and the opportunity to create and to do their jobs and to play. I had two amazing mentors there, Miss McGinnis and Miss Murphy, the first, an actress and a leader with the International Schools Theater Association, the second, an artist and a philosopher. They showed me that a classroom could be a haven. It could be a place where students and teachers could have real, raw, earnest discussions about life and things that mattered, where people could connect on important and personal levels, where life could be explored and discussed. I was exposed at that time as well to the International Schools Theater Association, and I could do a whole talk just on them because I feel like the International Schools Theater Association ensemble method of drama could be a textbook way of transforming any space, any classroom into a haven for the dreamer, a way to protect the dreamer. You get smiles like this in spaces like that. I'm not going to talk more about the International Schools Theater Association, but I will end today with a story from that organization. I was able to go on an International School Theater Association festival to Terezin in the Czech Republic. Terezin is a beautiful town located about 60 miles outside of Prague in the Czech Republic, but it has a very challenging history. Back in 1942, Terezin was used as a concentration camp for the Nazis, and thousands of Jewish people were sent there, never to return again. Now, the different thing about Terezin is that it was meant to be a sample camp, uh, a place where the Nazis could show the outside world that these camps weren't so bad. They were meant to protect the Jewish people, not to cause them any harm. It was the place where many of the first Jewish people were relocated, many of the prestigious intellectuals, artists, musicians, and children around 15,000 children to be exact, in Terezin. We started just by exploring, trying to come to terms with what had happened in this place, such a beautiful place, but with such a dark history. We toured the grounds where the concentration camp uh, victims had lived, where they had worked and played, dark corridors, and then we thought about their lives. We thought about who they had been before and the things that they left behind. And we started to integrate this in the way that ISTA does. We started to make it real and make it human and give voice to what had happened and hear the stories of those people and take some of that pain into our own hearts and process it through drama into something that had its own expression, something that was at once incredibly sad and incredibly beautiful. And by doing so, help to integrate that experience for all of us. For me, it was the children. So many children and the adults that risked so much to look after them. I was told, we were told, that uh, the children wanted to draw, to paint, and to create. And the adults would risk their lives to steal small scraps of paper, 
art supplies so that the children could have a chance to create. And many of these drawings survived, buried under the ground, crammed into some of the um, places, some, some of behind the bunks in some of the, the housing areas. And these show that from the child's perspective, hope had never left. They could still see the green grass. They could still see the butterflies. Even in the darkest of times, they could still feel hope. They had protectors, but they could still feel hope. So I was moved. I mean, we were all moved by this experience. And by the end of the day, a song had come to me. The words, the melody, all just into my mind. And as the ISTA people are so gracious and open and spontaneous to anything, uh, any suggestion, I asked if I could share the song with the group at that last session. They said, of course. And so I started singing the song, and then another voice joined, and another. And by the end, all of the people there, we were all singing this song, this song that had somehow been inspired by the work of these children from from so long ago. Not too much longer, I'm back in Warsaw, Poland, and another college classmate had come through town. Now, she was bringing a group of Jewish students through Europe to tour concentration camps and asked if I would speak to them about Terezin and my experiences there. And I did, and I told them about the horror, but also about the healing that had been experienced, that I had experienced through art, and I shared with them this song. And just a couple weeks after that, I got an email from her that said, on one of the last nights of their tour, after they had also experienced the horror and experienced some healing, they sang this song, this song that was inspired by those children that was inspired by those adults that protected them, that was inspired by those teachers that brought the students there for that festival. They sang it as the Jewish people that were meant to be exterminated, but that were not. On the banks, alongside Jerusalem, they sang the song, and I'll sing it for you now. Very simple melody. I'm around you. Any time that you need me, all you have to do is think of me. And I'm around you. Any time that you need me, all you have to do is think of me of me and I'm around you. Thank you. At the beginning of this talk, I encouraged all of us to be protectors, but here's the secret. Before you can protect any young person, like my protectors protected me, the first person you have to protect is yourself. Your inner child is just waiting to have permission to play. Your inner artist wants a choice and a chance to be creative again. Your inner adventurer is waiting for its imagination to be ignited. And all it takes is a few scraps of paper for your inner child to see with hopeful eyes the beauty that exists even in the darkest times of our world. Educators are the servants of the humanities. It is our duty to transfer the accumulated knowledge, skills, lessons, all that was learned from our, from our ancestors to the next generation. But we are also the servants of humanity. And sometimes we are the last line of defense against some of humanity's greatest natural resources, things like play, creativity, imagination, and hope. Today, I encourage all of us, but especially the educators among us, to protect these natural resources of humanity, to be protectors of the dreamer. Thank you.